Happy Sabbath. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. You may have picked up on the theme here this Sabbath. You know me, when I talk about the times in which we live, prophecy, those kinds of things, I do it under the theme of love. Because it's a, a, it's a God who loves us that through Jesus gave us a testimony about the time in which we lived. Amen? And so today is the last of a mini-series of sorts called, uh, titled, In His Image. Uh, today we're wrapping up with a revelation of love. And it's very simple why I chose this, this title. It's because when you are recreated in God's image, you become a revelation of love. Isn't that beautiful? And I think that's what he's wanting from us, his people today. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the the times in which we're living. We kind of pick up from two weeks ago. Uh, We had a little bit of a bridge there with uh, uh, Alan Reinick, who was here this last Sabbath. And then we're going to uh, finish talking about kind of the things that are going on today. And then I'll start preaching, (laughs) which is the really the message, which is the appeal. (laughs) So bow your heads with me, please. Father in heaven, we are so blessed to serve a God that loves us so much. It is absolutely true that you love us. And it's because of your love for us that you gave us a testimony through Daniel and Revelation. And we can look to that and understand how to navigate the times in which we live. And that's what we're talking about here today. So Lord, help me to speak with clarity. Touch our hearts and our minds. May we be challenged. At the same time, May we understand that that challenge comes because you want us to know what is ahead and the God that we can trust to get us through it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As pastors, sometimes we're referred to as under shepherds because we're under the authority of Christ to shepherd his church. You know, we, we serve as advisors, counselors, nurturers, disciplers, all these different things. But also, one of the th- things that we are, are watchmen on the walls. Have you heard this term? A watchman on the walls of Zion or Jerusalem back in ancient times watched out to see when the enemy was approaching. And when they saw the enemy approaching, they sounded the alarm. So in many respects, we are also called to sound an alarm when we see things coming, an enemy approaching from whatever angle that uh, he is approaching. And he's got several angles. There's all kinds of directions here today. But I want to share with you a message that God has laid on my heart. I've been putting off this series for months Uh, I wanted to cover the uh, fruit of the Spirit before we dove into this, but we're going to wrap this up here today. So thank you for uh, for being here. Two Sabbaths ago, I spoke about this alliance described in Revelation 13 that is formed between the dragon and two beasts, which are kingdoms. We learned that it is the second beast rising from the earth that the enemy uses to set up an image that will speak like a dragon. That image, we learned, is apostate Protestantism. Now I want to encourage you to go back, if you haven't heard that message, and listen to that. Well, you can't listen to it now before you're going to hear it today. But go back and listen to it, and you're going to get context. You're going to get context. I, I shared that. It sounds funny. But for those online and they're hearing this later, they can stop, they can hit, hit pause, and they can go back and listen to the other one first. So that's why I say that. All right. We also saw in that message that Revelation 17 gives us more detail about the time in which we live. So Revelation 12, great controversy. Revelation 13, this alliance that is going to come up against God's people. Revelation 14, the message 
going out to the world to warn the world of that alliance and what's happening. Revelation 17, more detail about that. And then we're going to add on to those multiple layers uh, what I have here to share with you today. Christ warns the church in his testimony that Babylon the Great will make kings, world leaders, and the inhabitants of the earth who are citizens drunk with the wine of her fornication, it says, in verse 2 of chapter 17. This wine inebriates the world so that these kings unite to be of one mind to give their kingdom to the beast. So who's handing over their kingdom to this beast, to this power? The kings of the earth. This is a worldwide event. We're not seeing it worldwide yet, but this is where it's going. The wine described in Revelation 17 are the false teachings of Babylon portrayed as the harlot there riding the beast. And these false teachings, uh, out of all the false teachings, the deadliest of all, I believe, are what people think and what the church thinks about God's character. God is a God of love. Even when he acts in justice, it is out of love. But what we find sometimes is this idea that God is harsh and overbearing, a mean-spirited deity who thirsts for judgment. And this is what lies at the heart of this apostate movement, this mindset. It's accepting the God that is not of the Bible, but the God of this world's own making. Listen, the deadliest poison is that which appears to flow from the fountain of truth. Anybody that can say, that anybody can say, hey, I go to a Bible-believing church. And we all say, amen, right? The question is putting that into practice. <laughs> anybody can read it, open a text and read a text here or there. But let me tell you, this this word of God here has streams of truth that lie from beginning to end that are perfect, creating a system of truth that once you see, you know when something is a little out of order. And that's why I say the God of the Bible is a God of love and compassion and mercy, not a God of hate not a God that singles people out for judgment arbitrarily, but a God that came to this world through Jesus Christ, not to condemn the world, but through the world they might be what? Saved. So, Revelation 13, 17, describing this religio-political alliance between Babylon and the nations of the world. But we ha how does this whole thing come together? That's the question. So, like prophecy does, it repeats itself. You find throughout prophecy, you'll have prophecy introduced, and it's repeated, giving you more detail. Then it's repeated again, giving you a few other nuances. And so, we're going to go to another text. If you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to turn with me to Revelation 16. The, scriptures, the scripture will be up on the screen as well. But Revelation 16 is a, is, is a description of the seven last plagues. This is the plagues that fall on the world at the end of time. But in the middle of this one plague, the sixth plague, it's like it almost echoes back. It says, okay, here's what happened. Here's what occurred to get us to this place. And we read in Revelation 16, verses 13, 14, and 16. And I saw three unclean, what is it there? Unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth, mouth of the false prophet. Now, right there, you, sh you should recognize something, right? This is an alliance of how many powers? 
Three powers, we've already seen this. This is the dragon and the two beasts in Revelation 13. And this is again uh, found a little bit more detail in chapter 17. But now we're seeing how this is going to work. It says then in verse 14, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So these unclean spirits coming out of the mouths, what is that a depiction of? What do you do with your mouth? You talk, you speak. There's a connection here to this entity that speaks like a dragon, right? This is the speaking that's going on. The interesting thing is we've already identified these powers of this alliance, the dragon, we know who that is, Satan. Uh, the beast who is there, we saw then in Revelation 13, it's Rome. And then the second beast of Revelation 13, we've identified as apostate Protestantism within the United States. That's clear, that's our, that's our prophetic model. We've known this for years. But it's interesting because this time, it's not called the beast, the third, the third uh, of the alliance, the third entity. What is it called? False prophet. Interesting, false prophet. So the second beast of Revelation 13 is the false prophet of this alliance. It's the one who speaks, which matches again Revelation 13. Now, I appreciated uh, uh, something that uh, Alan Reinick spoke yesterday, speaking on uh, in the first presentation there during our Sabbath School Christian Nationalism and kind of exposing the mindset of what we have today that is growing within America. And that's important that we understand, we keep our eyes, our, our pulse on what's going on in the world. And I will say this, I know that it's a challenge to some of you, but uh, you cannot talk about prophecy without talking about political movements. Do you understand this? I, I think I mentioned this two weeks ago. Daniel, every single thing, those beasts in Daniel 7, those uh, again in Daniel 8, uh, again in Daniel 11, all of them are political movements. Fights, battles, wars, all these things. So today we can't say, okay, no talking about political movements. Can't do it. Um, the Bible is here to give us a picture of these movements in the last days. Now notice this, this, this battle. Uh, uh, how many times have you heard in fact, I don't know if I read this. Verse 16, they gathered them to a place in Hebrew called Armageddon. Um, how many have heard the term the Battle of Armageddon? Most of us, right? Do you know that that does not exist in the Bible? Armageddon here is not describing the battle. It's describing the place where the three spirits and the alliance gather their forces together for the battle. And I know loosely we can say this is a battle of Armageddon because Armageddon is coming against God's people. So I'm not saying the battle of Armageddon is completely wrong, toss it out. I'm just saying Armageddon is this place where spiritual forces are gathering, they're, they're collecting, they're building an army. And it's an army not just of, of ideas, because this is a battle between truth and error. This is an army of political wills and countries and nations because the whole world is coming together to form this alliance, right? Are we on the same page so far? With recent events that we're seeing, we've been tracking this for a long time as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. With the recent events that we've been seeing, some, th there should be some awakening in your mind to a problem. Are you seeing it? There should be something that is saying, oh, wait a minute. Something's going on here that we have seen coming and we've been preaching about for years, for 170 years. And look, it's kind of like it's happening. Uh, I was talking to a, a friend of mine, another preacher, and we were thinking, you know, boy, this, this stuff, you know, we're, we've been talking about this for years. He said, yeah, he says, uh, no, I don't remember actually if he said it or, 
or I said it, but anyway, we, we came to the conclusion that we used to talk about or preach about what would happen in the future. Now we're preaching about what is happening. Okay? In this last battle between truth and error, good and evil, the devil is using two different sides. He doesn't hit all from one side. He's too smart for this. The devil's been studying, and he knows, and he's been kind of leading us into this thing, these, these last events. He's been, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's using two different sides, two opposing uh, ideologies to set up his final deception. They are both by, driven by the spirit of the dragon in that they each want to control. They want to rule. They are both authoritarian. One tends to come from a, a worldwide, kind of a new world order perspective. The other is coming from a national perspective. And they look to be against each other right now. Let me tell you, they're not. There's a lot of things being said about how these two op are opposing each other. And to a degree, it's true. But we're going to see that one does come out on top and will bring about the world's end. That battle is in Daniel chapter 11. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time in Daniel chapter 11. I'm just going to give you a quick recap. In Daniel 11.40, it says that at the time of the end, the king of the south will attack him, that is the king of the north, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, with many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. Which entity, the king of the north or the king of the south, wins this battle? The north. We have understood that the king of the north for a long time has been Babylon. That's, that's, think geographically here. To the north of the glorious land of the Holy Land, what is to the north of that? Europe. You even find to the north that would attack from the north, Babylon. What is to the south? Egypt. And it describes that as well in Daniel 11, Egypt, which is a symbol of secular atheism. This battle between secular atheism and this apostate Christianity, they're locking heads right now. They're, they're in the middle of a battle that only one will win. And what do we see? Who do we see wins? The king of the north. It is true. It's prophetically. It is true. The, this idea, this apostate Protestantism allied with other uh, religio and political uh, powers, that they will come out on top. We're assured that. And we'll talk about why here in just a little bit. We'll look at the catalyst for that here fairly soon. But when you look at both these sides, <laughs> we have to ask, which one is the greatest threat to God's people? Which is the greatest threat? Come on, it's not a trick question. The North. Because the North defeats the South, and the North is the only one left. And they come against the glory land, glorious land. It says in the rest of, uh, of Daniel 11 that they um, hear this, the tidings, these from the East and the North, and they return. And of course, those are directions from where the gospel, the everlasting gospel come from. That's a depiction symbolically of that. So it will come against God's people. This is where it's going. When Ellen White wrote, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So how will this shift occur? How's this going to happen? We know the parties, we know what will happen, but how is it going to happen? Because, you know, we, I mean, come on, let's fess up here. We love to speculate, don't we? 
We love to speculate. Oh, I think this is going to happen. No, I think this is going to happen. Oh, no, this is going to happen. Uh, and that's fine, as long as we're not overly dogmatic about what we think will happen, right? So I, I'm, I'm trying to stay within the realm of Scripture here and what we understand. But, but I believe that the passage we, we read here just previously from Revelation 16 reveals kind of how this happens. This, these unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet, they are spirits of demons performing, what is that word? Performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather. These signs are a rally to the world's powers. Uh, in, in chapter 13, it's signs and miracles even calling fire down from heaven. Same kind of stuff going on here, described in both, but in different places. Or both events, uh, both same event, different places in the Bible. So what we're seeing here is this, all of a sudden, this shift to where the north, this religio-political kind of alliance that is being formed, it comes together because of these signs. Um, Put yourself, just for a moment, into the mind of a, an, uh, for an example, an atheist, okay? An atheist believes there is no God, right? And only believes in natural, the natural occurrence of law and other things, not the supernatural. All this stuff is, you know, Christianity, uh, Islam, all the other stuff, that's just an invention of mankind. What happens when signs happen right in front of them. What happens to that argument when you, when they actually look out and they see miracles, fire coming down, stuff happening right in front of them? What happens to their argument? It falls. It falls by the wayside. So when these signs, these demons that go out to perform signs before the kings of the earth, that, those miracles will rally the support and it will be a, it will corroborate their false prophetic message. Right? But there's more to it than this. When Ellen White wrote that Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to clasp or grasp the hand of spiritualism, she was not merely referring to spiritual manifestations or even mir miraculous signs, but a demonic calibration of the mind and character of the Christian church at large. Listen to what I'm saying. This clasping the hand that Protestants in the United States do, they grasp the hand of spiritualism it's a demonic calibration of the mind and character of the Christian church that has become now the fallen apostate. Typically, we thought of, oh, you know, these, these miracles, demonic signs and stuff, those are just miracles. You know, and they are, but not just. What we're seeing in advance of this is a demonic calibration of mind and character. The church has changed, I'm talking about the church at large, has changed. It used to be that both sides of the political aisle could work together. How many were alive when they used to work together? <laughs> Compromises were made. I'll tip, you know, I'll give you this, you give me that, and, you know, our government would move forward. No one was, you know, hurling words or, or insults at each other as we see it today. But today it's like, they just can't even get along. And that's because this battle has reached a fevered pitch. There will be no backing away. There will be no return to um, working together. Okay, I think these sides are forever declared. Paul speaks about the spiritualism that comes into the church to unite and embolden apostate Protestantism, the, the fallen apostate within the United States it writes, or he writes, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. 
Now, how many of you thought that a doctrine of a church could be straight from a demon? Well, that's exactly what the Bible says, isn't it? And you wonder, okay, no, what we believe forms our thinking, doesn't it? What we believe about God uh, spills over into our relationship with him. If we think of him as harsh and judgmental, then what's going to happen when we mess up? We're going to be a little afraid of maybe what he's going to do next, right? But God's not like that. It's the devil that says to you when you do something that you're ashamed of, now you go to your corner until I'm quiet down here. He's the one that's trying to get you all riled up and you're thinking that God is, now I'm falling out of favor with God. He's left me behind and what am I going to do now? God says, listen, the moment you say the angry word or you do something against somebody, you know it was wrong. That moment, Jesus is saying, come here. Come here. Let's, let's talk about this. And let's change it. Let's, let's work together more so it doesn't have to happen again. Isn't that beautiful about how God changes us into his image? But while God is changing his people into his image, what is the devil doing? He's doing the same thing. He's transforming the image of people, professed believers in Christ. He's transforming the image through spiritualism and through false doctrine. Paul writes again in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13, for such, these are the people that are disseminating this stuff, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into who? Apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So you wonder how this stuff is getting out there, how the church is being at large. I'm talking about Christendom today, as well as, as Protestantism today is being transformed. It's being transformed through its teachings that are not biblical. And here's what it's doing. It's making people look at others with this us and them scenario that's being established, that's being created and formed. It's making people look at others and saying, oh, they're wicked. Oh, they're demonic. Oh, they're, you know, they're beyond help. You know, we need to do something about this. You know, the enemy is rising up against us. We've got to do something. We'll talk about that in just a minute here. Listen, in Nazi Germany, people had to learn how to hate it didn't just happen. The information was disseminated constantly. They were hearing constant things. They had training camps where they'd send their kids to. They were, they were in the radio, was constantly spewing hate. They learned to hate. I fear we're in the same process, but this time it's of a Christian origin. Let me share a little bit more of what, what I mean. We ask what false prophets are saying today. You know, obviously there are false prophets that are out there. If you look online and you do any kind of a search prophet of God on YouTube, you will get hundreds of hits. If, even if you say uh, Christ, who's Christ today? You'll get a lot of hits. So when Jesus said, false Christ and prophets, false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, same scenario, Jesus is looking for, he's telling the same stuff. This is back in, in Matthew 24. We're seeing a fulfillment of that through the degree of, of an explosion of false prophets today. And what are they saying? For the most part, it's an us and them kind of narrative 
where the enemy of God's kingdom is unchecked secularism, atheism. And God is right now raising up the church to take back America. Have you been hearing this at all? The spirit of the dragon that comes out of the mouth of these false prophets treats people who disagree with them not as people to be evangelized or, or, or saved for Christ, but conquered. This is not the spirit of Christ because he did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. I wish I had the time I told CJ, depends upon the time that I had left to bring out some things that are in a couple books and articles that I've been reading and I don't have the time to do that. But I, I, I want to tell you, it is reality that this brand of Christianity is becoming hateful. Hateful in the name of Christ. Jesus said, there will come a time where people will kill you thinking they're doing God a service. He's talking to the disciples. So now, here's the, here's the challenge. This left versus right, some people call it, Secular atheism versus apostate Protestantism, some people call it, or national, Christian nationalism. You know, there are lots of different titles for these things. We just learned the battle that happens there, that the one that will win is the Christian side of it, the nationalist side of it. The problem with this is that the devil has created a scenario to where that side is extremely enticing for all Christians including Adventists. Because you're, and if this is kind of your mindset, listen, I, was, I went through a period of being challenged by this too. But if you have this mindset that the, that the here's the buzzwords, the, you've heard them, radical left, right? All this stuff. If, if you're getting in this mindset of, these are the bad people. Who are you going to side with? The good people or the people that are more like you, that talk more like you. This is a trap. Friends, this is bait. This is an appeal for you to join the movement. And it's a Trojan horse, my friends. We've got to be careful because there is no security on either side. The only security is in Christ and his kingdom. And everybody is on our list to reach for Jesus. The everlasting gospel goes to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Listen, I may not agree with the way that some people live their lives because I've chosen to follow Christ. But I can respect their right to do so. I don't have to force them to stop. I don't have to force anybody to do anything because you know what? Forcing is not the spirit of Christ. It's the spirit of the dragon. So the moment I get riled up, we got to stop this. we got to take back America for God. All this stuff that's going on, that just underlying it, you can see God doesn't even talk like that. The true foundation that America was built on was not as a Christian nation, contrary to the narrative the people that established, that helped establish this country had fled persecution in Europe. The last thing they wanted to do was go back to it. So they created 
a constitution that kept that from happening along with the Bill of Rights, including religious liberty. Religious liberty allows us as Seventh-day Adventists to defend anybody, Adventist or not, to believe according to the dictates of their conscience and act accordingly. This is a free country. And we know what happens when church and state comes together, the results aren't good. In the parable for our scripture reading today, there's this wedding that is ready. And he sends out his servants to invite those who were, or to call those who were invited, invited previously, to the wedding because it was all ready to go. Uh, most scholars who look at that understand that this was an appeal that Christ was making to, uh, to the Jews. A last call, so to speak. Because once it says they, that what they did with the servants was kill them, spitefully use them and kill them, once that happens, he shifts his gears to another group. He says these words. This is from verse 8. The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not what? Worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. These weren't previously invited folks. These are new invitations, my friends. Those, so those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both what? both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. This is essentially the great commission that we have today still as a church. We invite all people, bad and good, to come to the wedding. It's ready. I'm going to read for you several uh, excerpts as I conclude from the landmark book on the parables of Christ, Christ Object Lessons, uh, page 225, and then so a few pages after that. I'm pulling some things out of this. But I want you to hear the flavor of what Ellen White is saying on this issue. Because she's commenting on this parable. However wretched may be the specimens of humanity that men spurn and turn aside from, they are not too low, too wretched for the notice and love of God. Christ longs to have careworn, weary, oppressed human beings come to him. He longs to give them the light and joy and peace that are to be found nowhere else. The various sinners are the objects of his deep, earnest pity and love. He sends his, his Holy Spirit to yearn over them with tenderness, seeking to draw them to himself. So how does God feel about sinners? He loves them. And he wants his church to help him find them and invite them to the wedding. Not to cut them off, not to conquer them, not to alienate them because of their beliefs being so radical and different, but to embrace them and to reveal the love of God to them. Because remember, all the church today, not only we find is being formed in the image of the dragon, I'm talking about the church at large. It's not only doing that, it is a terrible witness of God's character. I mean, just the signs you see put up at rallies, the stuff coming out of their mouths. It's not conducive or warm and friendly to people from the other side. God wants us to love on people, no matter what persuasion they are, because when they feel and experience and they hear of the gospel and the love of God, that that is a God I can follow. That is a God I can believe in. You know, most have not rejected God. They reject the God that is the making of humanity. Let's show them the God, the true God, 
the lover of sinners. Amen? Jesus said, as in the days of Noah were, again, Matthew 24, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as, as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. All right. I've, I'll tell you what, I have to confess. I've read that passage before and I've said, hey, look at all these wicked people. As in the days of Noah, it's just like it's going to be. And yes, that's true. That's true. But let me give you, let me share with you something else. This is, again, Christ object lesson speaking about this very thing. So it is today, men are rushing on in the chase for gain and selfish indulgence as if there were no God, no heaven, and no hereafter. In Noah's day, the warning of the flood was sent to startle men in their wickedness and call them to repentance. Wasn't that Noah's goal? Get people on the ark. So the message of Christ's soon coming is designed to arouse men from their absorption in worldly things. It is intended to awaken them to a sense of eternal realities that they may give heed to the invitation to the Lord's table. The Lord calls upon his servants to carry his message to the people. The words of everlasting life must be given to those who are perishing in their sins. In the command to go into the highways and hedges, now she's returning back to, to the parable. The highways and hedges, Christ sets forth the work of all whom he calls to minister in his name. The whole world is the field for Christ's ministers. The whole human family is comprised in their congregation. The Lord desires that the word of grace shall be brought home to every soul. So when we see, as in the days of Noah, it's not like, oh, those people, it's I got to go save those people. There was a, a co-worker, a lady that I worked back, this is back before I became a pastor, I, I was working at uh, uh, an insurance company in their reinsurance department. And we would go often down to San Francisco from Novato, which is where the, the, the headquarters were, to meet with some business partners and work some things out, some talk to them about what's going on and, and et cetera. And so my boss came to me and said, hey, John, I want you to go down and talk with so-and-so. I can't be there, but you, you can take my place. And take with you Carol. Let's call her name Carol. Take with you Carol. You know what the first thing I said? Oh my goodness. <laughs> of course, I couldn't show that, right? Boss is asking. But that's my reaction. Oh my goodness. She was the most foul-mouthed on our whole team, our whole department. She was the most foul-mouthed person there was. And I had just come back kind of into the church a year before. And I, 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 I love to share Christ and, and talk about Jesus and what he's done in my life. But this gal was beyond help. One time I had her follow me home because there was some flooding in the area that, that we usually go home. We were both headed to the East Bay. And I had her follow me home. And all I could see was in the car behind me as she's following me, all these, these cars that we had to, who also had the same idea. She's like, constantly. So anyway, I want you to take Carol. Okay. Okay, I'll do that. So it came two days later, I think it was. We met in the office, and we went down to Larkspur, jumped on the ferry uh, there. That's how we get into the city. The easiest, don't, have, don't want to take a car into the city. And so I'm, I'm there in the ferry, and I'm sitting next to her, and I hear as clear as day, God says to me, Share, share your faith with her. And I was like, oh my goodness, oh, no. <laughs> you don't know who this is. <laughs> oh, yes, I do. I want you to share your faith with her. So it's, it was my first foray into really kind of relational witnessing. 
because I'm not going to open up my Bible, and I don't have a Bible with me anyway, but I, I'm not going to just start preaching at her. So I sensed that God was leading me to say these words. Uh, there was something that had happened not too long before that, you know, something that was terrible in the world. I don't even remember what it was at this point. But I said, boy, the world is just not getting any better, is it? She said, yeah? Well, what do you mean? I said, well, I mean, the Bible's pretty clear. In the end, it doesn't get better. It gets a lot worse before Jesus comes. That's all, that's all I said. Like, matter of fact. She said, what does it say? Anyway, so this starts a conversation, and I'm starting to share. I shared all the way to the door of that business, that office that we were going to, and as I reached out to put my hand on that door to open the door for her, she grabbed my arm and she said, okay, now wait, we're going to pick up this conversation exactly where we left off, right? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I thought we'd get a reset here maybe, but no, okay, we'll pick up the conversation. The moment we left from that meeting, an hour later, she says, okay, so where were we? She was right on it again. We started Bible studies with her. She didn't, cur I, the cursing went away. It's like she just transformed. And she became my friend. One of my favorite people in the office. And uh, Rochelle and I, we would go over to her house sitting there with her, going through some Bible studies. She's just fascinated what the Bible says about things. And I lost touch with her. So I don't know the rest of the story. But, but I'm pretty sure that the Lord never let, a hold of, let go of her. And I'll see her again. We can't do the us and them thing. We can't write people off. We can't know ahead of time the way people will respond to the true gospel and the love of God we can't do that, although the world is inviting us to do that today. And we'll ultimately do that very thing. Last quote. Sorry, I'm holding you this long. From Christ Object Lessons, this is page 415. <clears throat> Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God. The last rays of merciful light, <clears throat> the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of God's character of love. That's our message. The children of God are to manifest his glory in our character. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the sun of righteousness she spells it S-U-N here, is to shine forth in good works and words of truth and deeds of holiness. You see, apparently, those are the kinds of things that the world is looking for today. And we are positioned as a people and as a church for this very hour, this very time and place to give this message, which is why I titled this series, In His Image. Let God transform you in his image. Let him make you a revelation of his love to everybody around you. Put the smile on your face. Don't get caught up in the political stuff. Just minister to people. Will you do that? That's what God is calling us to do. Because the strongest force in the world is the love of God. It does things to people like Carol that I could never have seen coming. And he will do the same for your friends too at the right time and at the right place with the right prompting. You can introduce them to Jesus. Oh, Father in heaven, this is the message. This is the heart of the three angels' messages in Revelation 14, the one that counteracts the alliance in chapter 13, the one that persecutes and seeks to cause the world to worship and forces the world to do its bidding. Lord, this is the message that counteracts that. this. It's, it is the message of the everlasting gospel that is taken to the world 
to introduce them to the true God of love and grace and compassion and mercy for people. Change us, inform us within, make us more like Jesus and help us, Lord, as we meet people to have the words to share that will draw them ever so closely to you and open up a willingness in their heart to hear the true message of what God is like and what he's done to save them. Lord, this is my prayer, and I know the prayer of every heart here. And we ask it in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you.